Welcome to CounterPoint. I'm Tanya Granick allen We have our current issues panel with us today, and we have a lot to discuss, including some Ontario schools cancelling Valentine's Day. Oh, talk about a wet towel. British Columbia decriminalizing small quantities of drugs. Cities in Canada banning tobogganing. Again, more wet towelism. And the Alberta government mandating free speech reports for post-secondary institutions. And if you follow conservatives on Twitter, beware, you might just get fired from your job for doing so. Well, joining me now to help unpack it all are political commentators Brock Stevenson and Hannah Salomon Vey. Thank you both for coming on. Excited to dive right in. Uh, let's start with the, as I call it now, my new thing, I'm coining it, wet towelism, how the government becomes a wet towel against fun in the world. We lived that through COVID. Here we are now. Valentine's Day is getting cancelled. Hannah, why don't you start us off? What's happening here? Yes, it seems that so many of the things that were cancelled during COVID, now that excuse, oh, we you know, we don't want to spread germs, all these different types of things continues, but also social justice activism, um, where we have people in the Peel District School Board and Waterloo District School Board saying that not everybody celebrates Valentine's Day. Some kids might feel left out, some kids might not be able to afford to give to a gift, so therefore we have to cancel it. Um, similar sentiments with the Christmas and other holidays. Of course, not everybody celebrates every holiday, but I mean, for those who do, it's a wonderful time to be able to share gifts. And if some students can't afford to, you know, give a gift to their classmate, then help them out, right, instead of canceling it. And I mean, it, it doesn't cost hardly any money to just draw, you know, a heart on a piece of paper and give it to your classmate, right? Um, historically, um, with a lot of activists, they used to be like, oh, some students can't afford a meal, so let's give them one. Now, it's some students can't afford something, so let's cancel it for everybody. I think that's a very... Um, you know, not helpful path to go down. And I think it makes a lot of students sad. And a lot of parents have spoken out saying that it seems that so many of the events at school are being canceled for so many trivial, trivial reasons. And like, look, I appreciate the sentiment. I'm not trying to diminish that if, uh, you know, there's a consideration of, of someone in the you know, financial concerns. I, I appreciate that. But this seems a little overhanded, a little heavy handed. Uh, what do you think, Brock? The war on greeting cards is ridiculous. I think we've got the first problem that they can't say that they're being anti-Christian and they can't say they're being anti-capitalist, but that's really what it is. There's no problem with colored shirts day. You could have orange or red or purple or whatever other color you want at school some other day of the year, but Valentine's Day is the target. It's sort of silly. I think that's the big challenge. Uh, I think schools should be celebrating more cultures and holidays and showing inclusivity, but Canceling them is the opposite effect. And the shocking thing is Valentine's Day is sort of the one holiday that everybody can agree yes. on is about love. <laughs> so you're canceling love. I feel that's awful. It's The symbol is the heart. It's not right. Uh, oh, my goodness. Anyhow, OK, let's move on to something else. Um, we'll talk about more canceling, about tobogganing. And we might spill out into the second segment about this. But I, again, I feel like we're canceling a lot of fun here. And look, I appreciate tobogganing can be very dangerous. I was one of those parents who used to make their kids wear a helmet to go down the hill. I know I am. I was very concerned about them getting concussion. But I would never advocate for canceling tobogganing. I mean, my goodness, that's one of the best parts of snowfall. Uh, Brock, what do you think about this? I, I think we've got a big problem in, in government over regulating society. Let, let's get back to what their real concern is. Start regulating tree forts again, maybe. I don't know. This is This is overkill. Uh, Oshawa doesn't need to be uh, the punchline of another GTA joke. They need to figure out how to make it safe for kids not to overregulate them. My goodness. Hannah, your thoughts on this? And this is not exclusive to, to Oshawa. Like We know that this exists in other jurisdictions in Canada. Are, are we taking enough health care concerns? Because tobogganing, it is, it is risky. I mean, they're mandated to wear helmets now for young children when they ski. Should maybe that be the way the government should approach or just be hands off? What are your thoughts, Hannah? Well, I mean, people talked about in the article saying that how about we just put up a sign saying use at your own risk, right? And then I mean that should absolve the city of any liability. But I mean, we live in such an increasingly litigious society where so many businesses and cities are just so afraid of being sued that it just takes the joy out of life. And also, I think it's just another reason for them to take away any sort of events or anything that could use um, precious taxpayer dollars, right? Like we pay so many taxes every year, and it seems like there's hardly anything we get in return uh, from the cities that we live in. This is something I definitely don't agree with. I would loathe to be the person hired by the municipality who'd have to go to the toboggan hills when all these kids are having fun and say, well, that's how I derive my paycheck, saying, no, your fun is canceled today. You get off that slope. I don't and know. we want more kids outdoors, not indoors on their laptops, right? 
We need to be outside enjoying the fresh air. We need to be sending the correct message to kids. Yeah, and as a parent, I know that there is a huge benefit to learning naturally the um, the uh, consequence, uh, behavior consequence uh, dynamics. Exactly. So that's what. Anyways, we're going to pick up this discussion in just a few moments. Welcome back. We have our Current Issues panel with us. And again, joining me is Brock Stevenson and Hannah solomon Vey. Thank you both for coming on. We're going to switch gears from cancelling fun to uh, something a little bit more serious, a cancelling of an employee. So there, from what I understand from this, this news article, an employee who lives in the UK was cancelled or fired because it was determined that this person, this employee followed conservatives on Twitter not tweeted conservative things, not engaged in conservative activities, but followed people on Twitter. Uh, Hannah, why don't you start us off? What, what's going on here? Yeah, it's disappointing to see who you follow on social media should not affect your employment status. And I know of other people, like other businesses who've um, been canceled or people have attempted to cancel them because of who they follow on social media. And again, it's you know regulating people's life off the job. That's something that's very concerning. And um, the company that fired her said that, oh, you know, we respect freedom of speech. We respect you, everybody, to have their own beliefs, but we're committed to having an inclusive environment, excluding this person who was fired, right? It's always we respect, you know, freedom of speech somewhat as a token, but um, we're going to fire anybody who, you know, thinks differently than us. So they're definitely um, sending very mixed messaging. Well, it seems you're right that this declaration, oh, we respect free speech, it's, it's tokenism. It's not really actually practiced. Hannah? Yeah, I 100% agree. Yeah, it's just the statement. We're going to make the statement to make ourselves look good, but then we're going to go ahead and fire somebody like this. But I mean, they wouldn't fire. I'm sure they wouldn't fire a trans person, you know, for following whoever they want online, right? But it's if, if you happen to think outside the narrative, then you're at risk of losing your job. And that's why a lot of people are afraid of, you know, their social media, what they could say online, even who they follow, um, let alone anything they could say on the job, right? So many people are self-censoring for fear of being fired. Now, Brock, obviously there are maybe reasonable limitations to what an employee does in their private life that could spill over in their professional life. If people are engaging in illegal activities personally, maybe that should have an impact on their employment. Uh, this seemed very innocent. Uh, they just simply followed, a, this person followed a, a variety of per persons on Twitter, not all conservative, some were left-wing, right-wing, whatever spectrum, and yet they were canceled. Uh, should workplaces have this kind of authority? Should this become the norm? Because it seems like it is. Absolutely not. I think the real challenge is much of tech and other big business think that DEI is more important than business as being the business of business. And this is, this is the big challenge we've got where businesses can't focus on the task at hand running their business and are, are getting too political, whether left or right. And this is a case of radical anti-democratic left in this example, but there are maybe some right-wing examples that I'm not familiar with. And I think that's sort of the challenge. Focus on your business. Uh, keep your personal life out of it. And people should mind their own business uh, regarding their coworkers' personal lives. I think eventually there will be a mass exodus from social media because the scrutiny is just simply too mm -hmm. high. Again, this person didn't tweet anything out. They're simply following a conservative commentator and, and were canceled as a result. And you're right, Hannah, you pointed out, well, it was, uh, as the article describes, a trans activist who said, well, this person's a transphobe, contacted the company, I guess after looking through who they follow on Twitter, and said, you know what, cancel. This, this person should be fired or I'm not going to buy your products anymore. So it was a threat of a boycott. This was one complaint. I do find it shocking that a company would act on one complaint. Is this... Maybe a company just looking for an opportunity to virtue signal Brock. I, I, I don't understand. I think it feels like such a heavy hand reaction, not even a, a conversation. Hey, you know what? Would you mind? Somebody's getting upset out there. I, I think companies don't know how to react. There's so much pressure and sometimes they do the wrong thing, such as this case. I think you need to figure out how to protect your employees, not make them targets. Yeah. Hannah, I, I do see this is increasing. I remember... Last year, there was an, a government employee who made a donation, I guess somehow it became public, to the Freedom Convoy in Canada, and they were immediately cancelled. Anybody who was linked with these things, again, that was an action. I'm not justifying that cancelling, mm -hmm. but that was an action. This was seemed so so low on the totem pole of cancel culture, really. Uh, it, it, are, are, you know, is everybody kind of cooked here? How does one protect themselves against this? Well, so many companies are afraid of 
they're afraid of the mob, they're afraid of the media. I mean, it's just crazy how like there's been like online trolls that have cause problems for businesses look you know they say oh you know they follow x y and z or you didn't post a black square long enough or you didn't silence yourself all week long type thing this happened to kelly's bake shop in burlington and they were on one of the news forum shows talking about how these online trolls and activists tried to cancel them even though they have a rainbow flag on their you know bakery front door okay it's never good enough right so stop worrying about the mob um, and these businesses, as Brock said, should be caring about their jobs, their what they're supposed to do as a company, not caring about um, these online trolls who need to get a job themselves. They have way too much time on their hands. OK, and on that, we'll leave it be. We're going to pick this up in just a few moments. Welcome back. We have our current events panel. And joining me again is Brock Stevenson and Hannah salomon Vey. We're going through a, a plethora of issues, plethora of issues, and I want to switch gears now. We're going to talk about a very serious one, something that's happening in British Columbia, where the BC uh, drug, uh, the BC government is decriminalizing certain drugs that are currently illegal for those 18 plus. Uh, there are people who are applauding this, and then there are people who are saying, no, no, this is, this is not a good idea. Uh, what do you see as, well, maybe unpack the issue for us, Brock, what's going on in British Columbia? So British Columbia has a major fentanyl problem. We're seeing about 2,000 deaths a year. This has been going on for several years. This is the solution the provincial government has got the federal government to agree to, to de decriminalize small quantities of drugs. Uh, there is no plan to have recovery or support plan on this. And Premier David Eby, who is approaching his 100th day in office, has been off more than he can chew. My goodness. And from what I understand, it's a it's a pilot program. They're just going to pilot this for a few years and see if that impacts numbers. Does a pilot program ever end? We're going to see this this go on and on. The problem will probably get worse. Uh, the downtown east side has been called hell on earth by the opposition leader federally. And it's one of the worst areas, but it's not just homeless people. There are people in, in families who are dying of fentanyl overdoses uh, that have uh, love and support around them. And th this isn't the solution to this problem. Hannah, what is your take on this new policy by the government? Oh, it's ghastly. And, and again, it's so many governments, um, they're like, we have to do something. We don't know what to do, but we'll keep doing that, which is not working, right? Um, in Vancouver in 2003, the first supervised injection site was um, installed in Canada. And the earliest data that I can find is 2012 to 2022. In 2012, there are 270 uh, drug overdoses in BC, so in the entire province. And then last year, there were almost 3,000. So we can just see that every year, and I've looked at the numbers, so every single, single year, they keep increasing exponentially. Uh, what we need is more private, especially faith-based uh, drug rehabilitation centers. Those are the centers that work. Handing these drugs out or allowing these drugs to be freely um, bought and sold on the streets like this is not the solution. Um, Aaron Gunn did an incredible documentary, has two and a half million views on YouTube. It's called Vancouver, Vancouver is Dying. Um, that video is not for the faint of heart. I don't know how these government officials, I mean, they live in their um, bubbles and we know that, but how can they look in the face of these drug addicts? Their lives are destroyed. These were functioning members of society. And obviously, you know, they, they fell into this for, you know, depression or loss of jobs or whatever. How can you look into the eyes of these people, family members, people that are all part of society that are now their lives are destroyed. How can you say this is the solution to this horrible problem that we have? Um, more lives are going to be destroyed. And I don't understand how they're not learning from California and Oregon, other states that have legalized drugs like this. And this pilot program is not going to end. They say it's going to be until 2026, but I don't think um, it's going to end. And I don't know what it's going to take for people to realize that this is not the way to go. So which drugs are being decriminalized, Hannah? Do you have that information handy? Yeah, so it's heroin, crack cocaine, MDM, fentanyl, um, these very hard drugs. So it's 2.5 milligrams that people will be allowed to carry um, with them. Um, but it's only two milligrams of fentanyl that it takes to um, cause someone to have an overdose. My goodness. And, you know, Brock, you also illustrate, is illustrated very well the, the concerns in Vancouver. In fact, on this show, uh, I think it was a two years ago, right in the beginning of, of COVID, we actually interviewed, I interviewed the BC chief coroner on, on fentanyl. We had a very good discussion, a very sad discussion, but a very good discussion going through all the numbers and, and what can be done. And it's it's really sad. Um, and, and definitely there's a fentanyl issue. But again, this is beyond fentanyl. We're talking about crack cocaine. We're, mm -hmm. we're beyond some of these other, you know, current crises drugs. And 
you know, you ask yourselves, is this actually going to help the problem? Is this just throw a Band-Aid on it and hope it quiets down? Or are we looking this to actually is, help people? This is taking action because there needs to be action taken. It's not the right action to be taken. The province is forcing the municipal and federal governments aside. They're not really too concerned about what social service agencies are doing. They're trying to have uh, a victory by solving this problem. This isn't a problem that's going to get solved in the short term, if at all. And I think the BC government needs to work better with its partners, not push everyone out. And really, this is a stupid idea. Uh, it, to me, it seems like it's going to snowball the problem. I don't know about you, Hannah. Uh, yes, it, it will. And like you said, I mean, we're talking about people from all spectrums, from white collar to homeless, everybody in between. Well, and, and the thing is, like, I mean, you can basically Uber these drugs to your home now. Like, there's been mothers have spoken out, especially during COVID. They didn't even know what fentanyl was. And their son, basically, you know, a drug dealer came to their home, gave him some drugs, and he overdosed in his bedroom. Right. And, and, and her and her other son found him there. Um, so this is like this is affecting um, people all across the board. Um, and the crime has gone through the ceiling because of the supervised injection site that was installed um, in my former city four years ago. OK, we've got to cut to commercial break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're wrapping up our current events panel with a really good topic. We're going to talk about free speech at post-secondary schools in Alberta. The province of Alberta is actually going to be doing something. They're going to see an annual, they want to see an annual report on freedom of speech from campuses, I guess, from universities and and other colleges. Um, Brock, why don't you start us off? What's happening here in Alberta and, and why is this coming from Alberta, not the federal government? That's actually a good question. Alberta is taking a stand and saying that free speech should be allowed at university campuses and ideas should be debated and not discouraged. And as the first part of adulthood, university and college should be the place where people start to see different ideas and learn how to tolerate different ideas. And Alberta is taking a stand there to show that we're going to do this. Some of federal conservative leaders have proposed it. Uh, they haven't been government during the time they proposed it, so it hasn't happened. So Alberta has decided to take the first step under uh, Premier Smith. And it's interesting to think, as you said, federal conservative leaders, this didn't seem to be a big issue back when the previous conservative leader, Stephen Harper, was prime minister. This is something that has percolated in the last few years, Um, but it's become a real problem. A lot of people are getting canceled. And of course, probably uh, the most famous of them all was Jordan Peterson when there was an attempt to cancel him when he spoke out about a government bill. A uh, lot of action on that. But this is this seems to be a real ongoing issue that needs to be dealt with in all provinces, even maybe at the federal level. Um, Hannah, what is your take on this issue? Is this going to be good enough? I think it's a, good, a step in the right direction. I mean, when these universities have to provide reports at the end of the year, um, and if, I mean, they're, they're supposed to, you know, detail what they're doing to be supporting freedom of speech and be, you know, supportive of events on campus that, Maybe they disagree with or, you know, the speakers have varying opinions, but I mean, are they going to be actually unbiased in their, you know, right, right ups of, in, in terms of what they're doing? So that's one thing. And then also, if they're not faring well, right, if you can see from the outside that they're canceling, continue to you know cancel uh, speakers and events and things like that, then what is the government going to do? Um, in return, right? And um, a ton of the universities in Alberta, um, more than 50% of their funding is from the government. So if they're getting taxpayer dollars, they are responsible to the taxpayers to be encouraging freedom of speech uh, and expression. And universities are continuing this trend of going extremely left-wing. These safe spaces that no one wants to be around or the majority of people don't want to be around anybody who might think a little bit different than them. So many professors are self-censoring. They're afraid of losing their jobs. And students are um, coming out, turning out, just being social justice warriors where they cannot stand anyone who thinks differently than them. And then they go on to live uh, lives working for the government or, you know, um, canceling other people because they've never learned to be in a room with people who think differently than them. Okay, but let's flip this around for a second. I mean, some speech is very offensive and some activities are very offensive to people. And maybe I'll ask you, Brock, is there a limit to free speech on campus? Is there a line in the sand? At what point do you say, okay, you know, that's gone too far. We can't, we really can't have this. Is there ever that fine line or or should we be totally libertarian in all of this? You can invite the other side. I, I'm not sure what the extreme would be, but I think that there are, there are too many limits at the moment. It's not that the, the wild extremes are being forced out. It's that moderate views are being canceled. And do you feel, Brock, that our political culture is, is encouraging this kind of behavior? Because, you know, 
sometimes I see what's going on in universities and I see what's happening at like, you know, the federal provincial government levels. And I'm wondering, are they just mimicking each other and are students just emulating what they see happening federally where people get canceled or like that woman on Twitter who followed a conservative person getting canceled? Well, if someone can get canceled for that, well, why can't I get someone canceled on campus? That could be part of the problem. Maybe, maybe society is becoming too much Twitter and too little Valentine's Day. (laughs) <laughs> That's a very good, you should coin that. Um, Hannah, you know, you, you were in university a few years ago. Uh, do you think things are getting better? Do you think something like this can actually, I know you said step in the right direction, but does this really have any teeth? Well, I actually, well, I graduated last October, but um, I remember when I first went to my university um, in Ontario, Doug Ward was saying that, you know, um, universities and colleges in Ontario, you know, that receive government funding have to be, I think they had to sign on to the Chicago Thing or whatever there was there was a freedom of speech thing they had to sign on to and I remember going to to um public you know sessions at Western about it and debates and everything um and it was very interesting to see the students that were shutting it down you know they were saying oh it's you know conservatism and you know right wing right wingism and I said this is an opportunity for everybody to be able to express themselves uh but yeah I mean by former university there's drag queen you know celebrations and, and dances and, and concerts all the time but I mean I know if Jordan Peterson wanted to speak there he wouldn't be allowed right okay uh, so, so question we've got to we've got to run did that and not the other did that Ontario effort make any difference on campus? No, not at all. No, no. My university is way more um, hostile and left wing under the name of equity, diversity and inclusion okay. but than ever before. OK, we've got to run. Thank you both so much for joining me today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. For CounterPoint, I'm Tanya Granik-Allen.